Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone. I have recovered from surgery, and we are back here on Perpetual Chess, and we have an exciting guest this week, an important guest. She is a 24-year-old from New York, New York. She was prominently featured in the excellent 2012 documentary Brooklyn Castle about IS-318 in Brooklyn, uh, which became a scholastic chess powerhouse and has won over 50 national titles. Uh, Rochelle herself was a top, top scholastic player and is a USEF expert with a peak rating in the 2100s. You guys may have heard uh, one of her former teachers, Elizabeth Spiegel, was on the show in December of 2019. These days, Rochelle is back in New York. She just finished graduate school, and she'll be telling us about what she's up to momentarily. Um, Career-wise, we'll also be talking about her life in chess and the chess world more broadly. Um, for years, she's been a staunch advocate for criminal justice reform and the Black Lives Matter movement. So what better time than now to bring her in? Rochelle, how are you? Welcome to the show, Rochelle Ballantyne. Thanks for having me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so is this your first time on a podcast, Rochelle? I know you're a big celebrity. <laughs> Not a big celebrity, um, but it is my first time on a podcast. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, I mean, I'm really excited to talk to you. Obviously, there's tons going on in the world between the coronavirus and um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and of course, here we mainly talk about chess, but I feel like it's a time in the world where there's no, like chess is an escape for a lot of people, but there's really no escaping everything that's going on in the world. So I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective about all of those things. But first, I just feel like we should get a little bit more into your background. Um, for listeners, hopefully you've, you've heard me say you guys should see Brooklyn Castle. So hopefully most of you have seen it by this point. But if you haven't, you might even want to stop the podcast, go get the movie on YouTube, go to the website. I think it's on Hulu and some other places. Um, watch the movie and then we'll catch up with Rochelle. But Rochelle, for those of those of people still listening, people who who know your story or knew your story up until 2012, what's been happening since then? Um, just college, graduating college, um, and then after college, I took a couple gap years to sort of figure out where I wanted to go next. Um, and then after talking with some mentors and and actually rewatching Brooklyn Castle, um, I sort of uh, came to this, uh, maybe epiphany is the wrong word, but some sort of understanding that um, criminal justice reform impacts education in ways that um, I didn't know before. And so maybe it would be better for me to first understand that intersection and, and get my graduate degree um, before going to law school. Because if I went to graduate school and I realized that I can do the things that I wanted to do without going to law school, then obviously save hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Um, but if I went to graduate school and I like realized that there was like a way for me to combine the two or, or, uh, or I still needed to like pivot in the law school direction, then I would always have that um, opportunity. Okay. Yeah. And I, sh I forgot to mention a couple other feathers on your resume, Rochelle. You got a full ride to Stanford University from which you graduated undergrad and you just graduated with a master's in education policy, did you say, at Columbia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and and you said your law school's next. Do you know where you'll be going? Yeah. I start um, at NYU in the fall, also on a full ride. Wow. That is incredible. That is amazing, Rochelle. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And you get to stay in New York. And I get to stay in New York. Are you going to stay where you live currently? Yeah, yeah. So um, my I have a pretty long lease here, so I'll be here for a while. And um, I'm still like getting to know the city as an adult. So I, I feel like it would be best for me to be like in the midst of it all. Yeah, makes sense. And, um, you know, you grew up in, in Brooklyn and now you're living in Manhattan. So it gives you like a little bit of distance, you know. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you can go see mom, but she probably won't pop in. 
<laughs> exactly. You're getting it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up in Philly and lived in New York for many years. So, and it's honestly not that different um, in terms of uh, the commute, you could say. But um, so, I mean, first of all, I told you this right before we started recording. We only chatted briefly, but I just think it's impressive that that you're you're fulfilling the sort of vision you've laid out. I mean, you're in the rare position of like your life was sort of caught on camera at a an age that's awkward for a lot of people. Um, and you were this this young, bright, you know, um, achiever, and you laid out this vision. And now you're. I was mentioning I read an interview um, two years ago in 2018 with I believe it was a. Uh, Vanessa West for U.S. Chess, um, where you also talked about wanting to get a master's in education and then get, going to law school and you're doing all those things. So the, uh, I hope you appreciate that, that you're you're doing good things, Rochelle. I, I mean, it's sort of surreal sometimes to just think about it. Also, her name was Melissa. Was Melissa. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, Melissa but, Matthews. Melinda right. Matthews, maybe? Okay. Melinda, My Melinda. Melinda yeah. Matthews. That's right. Um, but yeah, I'm one thing to know about me is that once I like set my mind to something, I don't, um, I generally don't give up. Uh, so once I like sort of framed that idea and formulated that idea in my head, um, I knew that that was the path I was going to take. Uh, and so now two years later to sort of like see everything fall into pieces, um, it's just very reaffirming. Yeah, it, it's it's super impressive. Um, you, one goal you were um, vocal about in Brooklyn Castle was to become the first African American female chess master. And I did check out your rating graph, um, and I saw you made it to the twenty one hundreds, but but didn't quite get there. So uh, I I know you have a lot of fans in the chess world, Rochelle. What's going on with that goal? Um, I think I'm going to. Uh... remain tight lipped about that. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to give people hope and I also don't want to let people down. So, um, I will say that it is a goal that's like at the forefront of my mind, but, um, I think chess just stopped being fun for me. And, um, I like found something that mattered to me more. Um, it just didn't seem like appropriate that I was playing chess while people who looked like me were dying. It, it just didn't sit right with me. Um, and I felt like I needed to do more. And so I like put all of my energy into doing more. Um, and, but I still do chess related things. I still go to events and like talk to kids and, and play with kids. And I think that's really where my joy um, stems from is just talking to kids. Um, and so I hope to do more of that. Um, I hope to get back into chess eventually probably sometime this year but don't hold your breath if i do it i do it if i don't then right and if you do it it's got to be for you right right exactly yeah and and obviously there's way more important things in the world um chief among them what you mentioned i mean so many african american people just being killed uh for for the color of their skin, whether whether it's consciously or some sort of unconscious thing, it kind of doesn't matter at some point. Um, so certainly, it's more important. And also, just you're you know you're at a stage in your life where you know these degrees you can hold on to them forever. You know, chess is a a lifelong companion that comes in. And I mean, for some people, it's a constant companion from the day they're born. But for other people, it comes um, in and out of their lives. And part of the beauty of the game is that it's always there for you. So, um, and I know, like, like you say, I know that it's not totally on the back burner. You know, I'm good friends with Greg Shahadi and he told me you've been sitting in on his U S chess school classes. So oh, what a snitch. <laughs> Greg is definitely a snitch. You know, <laughs> Sometimes he tells me stuff and tells me to keep it secret, but that he didn't say was, uh, was off the record. So, huh. so <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I'm so playing. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to the obviously way more serious things, could you so could you give a little snippet into what those classes are like? Um, you know, Greg's been doing. I'll, regular listeners will know he's the organizer of the U.S. Chess School, which of course does amazing work doing these camps that are traditionally for people under the age of 18. But with the coronavirus, they've moved online, so they're doing these kind of webinars and lots. Of, so they're able to open it up to more people than they otherwise would, which still mostly includes kids, but a few plugged in people. Um, 
can can sit in on them as well. So what's it been like for you, Rochelle, when you kind of have just your toe in the chess world right now, but then you watch these amazing teachers present? Um, I think it's it's sort of, it's definitely helping me remember why um, I love this game so much. Um, and also just to like hear, like a lot of the kids are, are definitely under, I think it's 15. So there's right. like a 10 year age gap. Yeah. Um, and they're just so brilliant. Like right. they just come up with like ideas super quickly and I'm pretty intimidated. And so it's like, okay, well, I can't have these little kids beating me. So obviously I need to set my game up. Yeah. It's, it's a common theme on this show. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> people who've, who've advocated for grown up only chess tournaments, you know, I mean, oh, I, I don't mind the kids. I, I just, um, they're, they sort of push me to be better because they're like so smart and because I am, I envy their, their joy that they still have and I envy their like commitment to it. And so they like being in a class with them um, is, is inspiring to me. Okay. Well, not everyone has as healthy a perspective. As you oh. show. <laughs> and I, myself, I mean, I teach scholastic programs. I have kids. I, I like kids, but it's just in, I mean, it's the combination of uh, their ubiquity. I think for some people, when when you go to tournaments, but the other thing is, like you say, they're they're so good. There, it seems unfair sometimes, you know, <laughs> like like they just assimilate patterns so quickly. So mm -hmm. obviously, I mean, they're the they're the lifeblood of chess, and if you want chess to be thriving, you need you need the next generation always to be interested. So um, <laughs> I, I like kids. I'm just saying it it's it's not it's okay if it's a source of frustration <laughs> for some people. Agreed. Okay, so. Beyond that, I mean, obviously, your your academics and your career and what's going on in the world are are much bigger, um, much bigger and more important topics. But like, why don't we start by tying it to the chess world, Rochelle? So, I mean, of course, there's sort of racial or socioeconomic undertones or barely undertones, uh, like overtones to Brooklyn Castle, um, a movie that chronicles, um, you know, the school having to adjust their plans based on unforeseen budget cuts and stuff like that. Um, but just as an African American woman, basically a, a double minority in the chess world, what what was your experience like um, playing? What were, what were your interactions generally like? Um, so I would say that, uh... I just didn't have the language to sort of describe my interactions at the time. Um, I sort of, but one thing that I do remember is that when I was hanging out with a bunch of like my girl chess friends um, and we were getting ready for the tournament, uh, one of my friends said, oh, I can't wear these shorts. They're too short. They might distract boys. Um, and that sentiment has always stuck with me to sort of like remember that chess is just so much more than than what's on the board um like perceptions and, and biases whether unconscious or not um also play a role and then also because i'm a double minority um people like took me for granted or um called me a charity case or um just like just these very like subtle uh racial um aggressions and stereotypes and um because my mom wasn't able to sort of like be there, uh, sh I didn't necessarily have someone who I can like talk to and better understand what was happening. Um, because it's like a male and white sport. Um, and so, yeah, so just dealing with that. And then when I got to college, realizing what was happening and sort of having those things sort of guide how I attend chess tournaments in the future and whether or not I did attend chess tournaments in the future um and and sort of shift my focus as to like what i want to do with chess okay and something like i mean you mentioned someone calling you a charity case that's that's awful to hear is that something that someone said to your face or is it like something that shows up in comment sections or how how did that happen oh no yeah somebody definitely said it to my face um, wow. <laughs> but again like i said i was young and so i didn't and i won and he was angry and um I mean, if you won, that says it all. <laughs> right, exactly. And so that's and that's the thing that kept that keeps like that kept me pushing. And it's the thing that I kept reminding people in my interviews is that I love to be competitive. And so if my if you make the mistake of downplaying um, my capacity and my ability, 
um, that's your fault. And if that makes you mad, that's even better for me because it just makes me feel like a thousand times better about beating you. Um, but when you like say hurtful things, I don't necessarily register them or I didn't register them at the time. But these are like moments that I think back to and, and sort of like remember, like when people ask me, why don't specific groups of people play chess? These are the moments that like play back in my mind. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so did you ever have thoughts of quitting when you were kind of in the middle of it? I mean, you you mentioned that it wasn't the, the sort of gravity of it maybe didn't hit you at the time. Um, what were your thoughts in the I moment? Just, I just felt alone. Uh, I like at all the tournaments, like even though people knew who I was and, and even though there were people rooting for me, I still always felt alone because there was like nobody I can talk to to sort of like um, discuss these things with. I mean, Justice, Josh, and um, oh, why am I forgetting? James. Justice, Josh, and J James, like they rose to fame pretty quickly and they always had each other to sort of like back them up and support um, them in their chess endeavors. There were three black men growing up in the same neighborhood and they were competing against each other, uplifting each other. I didn't have somebody like that. I only had either black men or white women to sort of like be my, um, my safe, uh, my safeguard or protector. Um, but those identities aren't mine. Right. So that's uh, Justice Williams, uh, Joshua Collis, and um, Jason Black. James. Right? James, James Black. Black. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, I don't recall if Joshua was in the movie, but obviously James and and Justin were prominently featured. Yeah, that's uh, that's a perspective you wouldn't get just from from watching the movie. I mean, it totally makes sense as you say it. Um, did you? So did you? have people that you looked up to in the chess world when you were a kid? Um, I mean, there were, I guess there were, there were really very few African-American women role models, but did you find other role models for yourself in the chess world? Yeah, uh, I think all of my mentors were, were role models. Every coach that I've had was always a role model and somebody who I um, felt safe with. Um, but Brooklyn Castle, I didn't understand Brooklyn Castle until I developed the language. So for me, Brooklyn Castle was just sort of this movie where these kids um, play chess. And I thought the only remarkable part at the time was the fact that uh, despite budget cuts, we were still able to like make it to nationals. But the only way we made it to nationals is by selling chocolate boxes. Um, and so it didn't seem like we were just doing what we were told to do in order to get to our goal. Chess was like very interesting entrenched in the curriculum in Brooklyn Castle. I'm sorry, yeah, in, in IS 318. Um, and so it was just us following directions. It wasn't anything special or like, um, I just didn't understand why people made it such a big deal with the exception of Patrick, because Patrick did have to like overcome um, his ADHD in order to like play chess. And that I, I found remarkable, inspiring. But for the other cast members, it was like, I didn't want to feel like charity. Like I'm not achieving these goals because I'm poor or because I'm black. I'm achieving these goals because I'm good at chess and I'm good at chess because I go to a school that teaches chess. Um, and then when I got to college, it was like, okay, well, why do people see us in this light? What are like the, the uh, mechanisms in play um, that allow this story to blow up? Education inequality or inequity. Um, because IS318 is like, most of the students are 70% below the poverty line um, because our budget was cut. All of our after school programs got cut. Why are you taking after school programs away from kids? And that's when it clicked for me. And that's when I decided I needed to go to grad school. Okay. And I mean, the, there's a, there's a lot of, I'd like to follow up on from there. So w one thing is um, you, you mentioned you, you rewatched the movie recently. Um, well, yeah, not recently, but in college. Oh, okay. My friends made me do it. Yeah, yeah. well, that was another question I was going to ask you is like, how many of them had seen the movie when you, I mean, I had, you know, I grew up in, in Center City, Philadelphia, like middle class white upbringing. And I had culture shock when I went to college at how 
white and upper class it was. So I can't imagine what it was like for you to go to to Stanford. What was your experience like and how many people had seen the movie and how did that impact your college experience? Um, well, Stanford was definitely culture shock because I'm from a big city. And so going to uh, Palo Alto was definitely strange. Um, and I was homesick a lot of my time there. Um, but Stanford is different than other colleges in the sense that they carved out spaces for underrepresented groups. And so we had a black cultural center, we had a black dorm. And so I mainly spent my time there with those groups of people. Um, but then obviously like any other place, like when I went to school, when Trayvon Martin happened, um, I ended school at the election when, when Trump got elected. Um, and sort of like these pivotal moments that sort of like re remind us about the racial underpinnings of our current society. Um, the lines are are very much more more present, um, and so obviously that has like had an impact on uh, my interactions at Stanford. And sort of, uh, I got arrested for protesting, and then after uh, when I got back to school. Um, we found nooses at the black dorm. Um, nice. they called us monkeys. They called us the N word. They like demanded we be expelled from the school for like shining such a poor light on Stanford university. Um, and sort of dealing with those things and not really feeling like we had support from the institution was just like a larger reminder of like society in general. Um, and what we'd have to go through when we leave, like our Stanford degree doesn't protect us, uh, from the color of our skin and, and sort of re realizing that uh, reality uh, and the gravity of that reality definitely shaped my Stanford experience. That's awful. Wow. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, man. So, so I, I mean, Oh, I, I didn't I, answer the question. Oh, you asked about Brooklyn castle friends. Okay, sorry. <laughs> they uh, randomly Googled me. They found out that I was like this chess player person who was in a movie. And then my dorm sort of ganged up on me and like forced <laughs> us to watch it in the dorm room and then proceeded to make fun of me. It was a great time. I'm sure. I mean, but whatever. I mean, you know that you came off well in that movie, right? They just have like a very different idea of Rochelle. Like I just looked starkly different. And so they made fun of the way I talked, the way right. I dressed, yeah. um, just very childish things. It was funny. It was, it was, a I mean, time. okay. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. vast majority of people are, would rather not be like chronicled in a movie when they're, what were you 14, 15? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, you, you, there's a, there's a lot, <laughs> sounds like you, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, um, serious experiences from Stanford, but <laughs> that one sounds, I wouldn't worry about what your friend said too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so bringing it back to, to the chess world for a minute, Rochelle, because I mean, there's, there's obviously so much that needs to change in the society and in the chess world uh, generally, I mean, in society generally, but, but given what you experienced in the chess world, what, what can we change? Like what, I mean, actually, why don't I go ahead and read you um, this question from Patreon supporter of the podcast, Erwan, er, sorry, Aaron Holloway Nahum. So Aaron, first of all, thanks for the great question and thank you for the support. Um, and Aaron uh, struggled, struggled with how to word this as I briefly did just now. So Aaron says, it's hard to know exactly how to word this question. So please forgive me if the wording's poor. One of the questions that has been facing the ordinary white person over the past weeks is the way that acting just normal with complacency contributes to the inequalities and evils within the organizations and systems that we have roughly but not um, that, that we have grown up in. Um, yet it can be hard to know exactly what to do proactively. E.g., you might want to be particularly welcoming to a minority or female player at a chess tournament, but equally you don't want to impose on someone who's trying to focus and or make someone feel uncomfortable. What advice do you have for the ordinary chess tournament player, um, someone not organizing events but just attending? What can someone like that do at tournaments and between tournaments to promote, I mean, to promote and fight for a more welcoming, diverse, and equal community in the chess world? 
Uh, ooh. So I've been thinking about this question a lot. Um, and it's there's no really like good answer because there it is difficult to tiptoe that line between um, wanting to be welcoming and not wanting to impose. Um, what I would say is that like, or I guess I had this idea in my head that like maybe if we're all in the Skittles room, you'd invite that person to play Blitz or, or just like a, a Skittles game or something um, to sort of make them feel more welcome. But uh, there is sort of like this, chess does feel, just very much feel like a boys club. Um, and I think sort of just like disrupting those notions and, and creating spaces and whoever's in charge, um, pushing on on the people in charge to sort of like create more spaces where it that's not necessarily the case. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure, I don't know. Because even like thinking about when I was playing chess, like I always had my headphones in. Um, I didn't, I wasn't necessarily very approaching, approachable. Um, and if somebody walked up to me, I would feel pretty bothered. Um, but I think there are ways for you to sort of like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry, I couldn't give a better answer. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a it's a challenging question. I mean, one thing that occurs to me is obviously if you see, in it, like obviously this has been coming up a lot sort of in the general social discourse, if you see inappropriate behavior, obviously that the bare minimum is to call it out, right? Oh yeah, of course. I, and I think that's, yes, absolutely bare minimum because there are a lot of like, um, like even mentioned, referencing back to that that moment where my friend was like, I have to change my clothes so that I don't seem distracting. Like, what does that say about the chess world that there are like men who are, who the women deem as predatory and that they don't want to distract them from their game. And therefore I have to change the way I look or dress um, to appease you. Um, like even, I don't, even that is just sort of like, just shocking to me. And so Yes, bare minimum, but I just also think like we can continue to do more. And I and I think that starts with like pushing back at leadership and so at the USCF um, and demanding that they do more to to create these these spaces. Okay. Yeah. And I, I want to follow up on the USCF issue or matter, but I also just wanted to mention before I forget, I don't know if you saw this, Rochelle, I, I just came across it yesterday. So I think it's fairly recent, but Alexandra Protez talked about some of her experiences just being a, a young lady in the chess world. One incident in particular involving sort of um, um, inappropriate behavior from someone who was around 20 when she was 14 traveling to a chess tournament. And I know that, um, you know, again, something that's happened society at large, um, but I don't think the chess world has been a safe space by any means for uh, young women um, with a predominantly male um, environment and, you know, people just um, doing things that, that they shouldn't do. So I'll, I'll link to that. I mean, uh, Alexandra talked about it and um, very moving and um, a lot more detail than we can get into now, but, but I mean, it's um, certainly a deeply embedded problem. Mm -hmm. so. And, and very gross, um, yeah. especially like with young women who aren't traveling with their parents. And so they don't have sort of that uh, caretaker to sort of call people out when they're doing gross things. Um, but yeah, 100% agree. Okay. And yeah, I want to ask you about the USCF, but first we're going to take a break to hear from our friends at Chessable. This week from our friends at Chessable, I wanted to highlight the expanded and updated Checkmate Patterns Manual by Crafty Raff with an optional video course available additionally from none other than I am John Bartholomew. This course has over 1,000 checkmate patterns, including some of the most famous ones in lots of their different iterations. There's the Anastasia mate, the Greco mate, the Arabian mate, the Smothered mate, the Morphe mate, the Pillsbury mate, just to name a few. On and on the list goes. It's a great way to drill your checkmate patterns and make sure you have them down cold. And it is on sale through June 5th. So whether you choose just the regular course or the course with John Bartholomew's video, go to chessable.com and have a look. And we're back. And Rochelle, I did want to. So 
you posted on Facebook yesterday mentioning this interview, and you mentioned you expressed some frustration with with how USCF has handled um, race relations generally. Um, so beyond the individual level, as Aaron had asked about, what about sort of at the um, organizational level? What, how can uh, the chess world hope to become more more welcoming? What can we do to have um, uh, a player base that's more representative of uh, what what the population looks like? Um, well, the USCF in that statement said that they were listening. So I'd be curious to know who they're listening to and who they're talking to for like advice and sort of how to restructure. Um, I remember that their board is, is generally white, um, which is part of the problem. Um, and I was talking to Justice about this and he mentioned that um, in order for like more uh, underrepresented groups to feel comfortable playing chess, they need to see why chess is cool. And they need to see why chess is cool from people who look like them. Um, a lot of us are like in way, not way, but like into adulthood and, and shifting gears in terms of what we're focusing on. Um, but there needs to be a better way of sort of like representing what equality and diversity looks like. And it needs to be done in a way that doesn't sort of represent us as like um, anomalies or charity cases, because that's not what we are. Like the only difference is that we're of a different skin color, but a lot of our, um, we still like share the same ability and still and same love for the game. So I think the USCF really needs to think about um, what initiatives they should take in terms of creating that. And maybe that starts with expansion into more schools. Um, maybe that looks like ex uh, uplifting already established initiatives like Chess Girls DC or the clubs in Detroit and Kentucky um, that are predominantly African American. Um, they just need to do more. Like you shouldn't just be listening and you shouldn't just be putting out statements it doesn't do much for anybody because you're putting out the same statements continuously. This isn't the first time a black man has been killed by the police and unfortunately it won't be the last. And so is, are you just gonna keep putting out statements every time this happens? Um, what are you doing to sort of educate yourself as to what's happening in the world and the ways in which your chess players are affected? Um, Daniel Jones in his chess article also mentioned um, sort of making tournaments be in a more, uh, what's the word? Accessible. Yes, location. exactly. Accessible yeah. location. Because if, like he mentioned that if he wanted to get something to eat at night, he doesn't feel safe going out in the suburbs to, to get food. Like that's a problem. Um, you have to accommodate all of the players that you're targeting or that you're you're bringing into this community because even though we're all we all have the shared love for the game we all have different experiences in how we face it um and even just like after the statement like the comment section people still commenting all lives matter people saying that like they don't want chess to be political this isn't political this is my life this is the way i live this is a lived experience um, and I think that just needs to be understood first and foremost, is that this is how I live. This is how the black players in chess live. This is our daily experience. We could be next, and it's important to recognize that. And it's important to recognize that at tournaments, at these tournaments that we go to, the next time, it could be at those tournaments. If we dare to leave the hotel grounds, we're not free in the same way that other, excuse me, that other people are. And I think it, there just needs to be a better like sort of understanding and compassion and empathy for the different experiences of others. Wow. Um, a lot of great insights there. I just want to um, 
just want to men um, mention a couple of the things you referred to for any listeners who might not have seen them. So U.S. Chess issued a statement on June 9th um, in, in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. So I'll link to that and anyone um, interested can can read it if they didn't already come across it and form their own impression. And the interview that Rochelle mentioned with uh, Daniel X. Jones was part of a three interview series that Peter Doggers did for, for chess.com where he interviewed uh, different um, African or African-American um, players um, about their experiences with racism in the chess world. I, I highly recommend um, all three pieces. Um, there was one with uh, Grandmaster Pontus Carlson, who of course has been on the show. Um, there was one with I am Aman Sim Simatoi. And then this interview with uh, Daniel X. Jones from Chicago, USCF master Daniel X. Jones. And it's interesting what you say. I mean, and first of all, I mean, I, you know, broadly, I mean, I think you make a lot of a lot of excellent points. I mean, there, there's got to be a way to make chess more welcoming um, and, you know, uh, to, to foster more interest from the African-American community and, and make sure that that people have the opportunities they need to to pursue this great game. Like you say, it's a it's a shared love. Um, but I mean, one thing about USCF is they're not the ones running all the tournaments. So I think it's definitely an issue vis-a-vis -vis like nationals and the U S open and stuff like that. But a lot of the tournaments, I think the point that Daniel made about them being very tough for people from cities to play in. And the, the fact about, I mean, the, the fact that, you know, he has to be scared to drive to get food late at night is just, that's just absurd and terrifying. And, you know, no, no white person can ever imagine what that would really be like to live every moment like that. Um, but I did just want to throw in that it's, it's not necessarily them running the tournaments. I mean, in some case it's a local organizer or it might be Bill Goitsberg. So, I mean, certainly there are changes that need to be made, but, um, it's probably runs across the spectrum where they need to be made. Do you, do you think that's fair, Rochelle? Uh, no, not, not really. Like, yes, fine. There are locally run tournaments, but I think because the USCF has that sort of countrywide platform, um, they have an obligation to their black and brown players to sort of create and foster this, this space. And I feel like the local organizers will follow that lead. Um, and, and obviously like, so yeah, I get, I, what I'm saying is that it starts from the top. Um, and so to sort of like shift blame, um, and, and yes, it's important to hold all parties accountable, but I think because of the role and the gravity of the USCF, it needs to start with them. Okay, Th that makes sense. Um, and we got some some related questions on uh, the the Facebook Perpetual Chess Group from a friend of the show, Peter Sodi, that I thought I would throw in now. Um, so, um, I'll I'll read two of them together, which are: uh, How does education policy need to change to improve the lives of the underprivileged, and what do you see as the main causes of um, the underprivileged having fewer opportunities? And do you think chess has a specific role in a general education program? Um, okay, so for the first one, it was what was the sort of problems in education yeah, policy? And okay, um, so I think, so because, so my master's research focused on the role of bias plays and punishment, uh, specifically for black girls and how, because of the un unconscious biases that we all have, um, it leads to black girls and black boys being disproportionately punished. And that continued disproportionate punishment um, inevitably leads to the schools to prison pipeline. So that's what I've been studying. And I think those that's one of like sort of the biggest things that's on my mind now is, is how we create safe environments where kids can be allowed to sort of fail um, while simultaneously allowed to, to be their full selves. Um, without teachers and administrators trying to conform them into to societal ideals that don't necessarily um, weren't made for them. Um, and so I think that's one thing is just just re checking and remembering our biases and how we can create and foster a more inclusive environment for all students so that we are not pushing kids out of schools and into prisons. Um, another thing I think obviously is funding as reference in Brooklyn Castle. Uh, New York City has the largest public school system in the country. 
and it is severely underfunded depending on which neighborhood you go to. Uh, in the schools that I work at, a lot of my fifth graders have behavioral problems, but they don't necessarily have support on how to navigate that. Um, a lot of my fifth graders couldn't speak English. Um, I'm not trilingual, so there are cases where we had to use Google Translate to sort of to translate lesson plans to them. Something that I think is so wild and, and so deeply disturbing. Um, so obviously, like, where are we putting that money? We're putting it, I mean, uh, this is a larger conversation, but like, why are we more concerned with police budgets than we are with education? And then I think that's a, a major talking point in the Black Lives Matter movement right now is sort of, um, how can we shift resources away from the police and into spaces that allow everyone to live a better life? Um, and then in terms of chess, in 318, chess was, was part of the curriculum, like I said. So we had a period dedicated to chess class and we got a grade for it. And I think that sort of, um, like I said, we were just doing what we were supposed to do. So in order to get a good grade in this class, we had to be on, at our best selves. And that sort of pushed us to sort of learn more, um, compete better. And so obviously I think that like that will be helpful in sort of creating more access to chess. Um, but I-318 also had other programs. Like there was a cooking um, class, cooking workshop. Mr. Galvin was so upset my eighth grade when I picked cooking over chess that year <laughs> as my, my period. Um, he thought that I was quitting. He never let me hear the end of it. I just wanted to eat food. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like just like having those sort of extra programs that sort of enrich students in different ways that aren't necessarily... Um, academic based. Um, and I think chess can, can definitely play a role in sort of enriching kids' lives if only students knew about it and had access to it. Okay. So if you were if you were made education czar, which hopefully someday will happen, Rochelle. <laughs> um, would, no pressure. <laughs> would you uh would you institute a uh would you be in favor of like nationwide chess as part of a curriculum, possibly amongst other activities? Yes, I would. I think that um, I don't necessarily see any downsides to it. Um, and I, I personally can attest to the role chess has played in enriching my life, um, getting me a full scholarship to Stanford, uh, getting me a full scholarship to law school, um, allowing me to like accumulate all these degrees and, and be able to travel the world and meet new people. Uh, there are just so many benefits. And I think that if we're talking about how can we make chess more inclusive, it has to start with, well, do people know about chess? What what do people, what are people's current ideologies and perceptions around chess? And how can we shape it and reimagine it so that it's um, appealing to others? Yeah. And I mean... So you mentioned the positive effect that chess has had on you. That's reassuring to to, to hear, um, because of course you've you've had positive and negative experiences in the chess world. But I'm glad that you're able to um, appreciate that that there've been some good things to go along with the the unfortunate bad things. So I know that you've done some some youth outreach. I mean, you mentioned working at schools as part of your. Um, master's program that you recently completed, but also in the aforementioned interview with Melinda Matthews, uh, you talked about um, talking to to some of the girls from the the girls in DC chess program. So when you see like young African American girls who've taken an interest in chess, what what sort of advice do you give them? Um, I try to let them know that they are enough they are they belong here they deserve to be here and not to let anyone tell them differently and that their differences are also their strengths um yeah that that's great advice and are, are you are you going to be able i mean i guess it's hard to know at this moment with you starting law school in a few months but are you going to be able to continue to do sort of education stuff on the side in the next few years do you think uh well i I'm pretty set on becoming an education lawyer. So I think once I start law school, I'll, I'll continue looking into that realm. Um, but I don't want to 
set that in stone because obviously like law school, there are like many um, paths I can take and, and many things during my time there that will influence me. Um, but in terms of education, last year, yeah, last year I went with Maurice Ashley to Ghana to teach um, the chess team there uh, and help them sort of improve. Every year I go to the Queen City City Classic in Cincinnati um, and I talk to kids there. And and, um, and so I, I feel like, I, and like I mentioned before, like I think that's the joy that I currently have with chess is sort of sharing my love with others and especially with, with children. And so to be able to like, go to places and and meet children and play with children um, and reassure them that they have a space here and that even though there are things that set them apart, whether it be race or class or whatever, um, all you have to do is win. Uh, That might be too corny, but (laughs) that's what I have for now. (laughs) No, I mean, it's, I mean, your, your success is certainly, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're, you're the one who deserves credit for everything that you've accomplished, but I mean, it's, it, chess was a nice vehicle for you to, to, to show your potential. And um, it's, it's wonderful that it's open, opened a few, it's opened some doors for you. Um, and it, it's, it's great to see what you're doing, um, both in and outside of the chess world. And, and speaking of, um, outside of the chess world, like uh, more broadly, Rochelle, what's as this, um, as these protests have, have um, escalated over the, the recent months, um, what, what's your day-to-day life been like? I mean, were you done with graduate school and um, how have you been processing the news every day? I mean, so as someone who um, has been vocal about these issues for, for years. Um, I'm pretty tired. I'm exhausted. I'm angry. I'm, I'm feeling like, I feel like every day my, uh, feelings swing from exhaustion to anger and just solely those two feelings. Um, and I think it's because every day something new happens every day, Mm -hmm. there's a new death. Um, every day there's another, uh, experience of like state sanctioned violence every day. I have to sort of reaffirm my life um, and prove to others why it matters, um, prove to others that I am a human being just like everyone else. My blood is still red um, and that the color of my skin does not make me uh, neither better or beneath anybody else. Um, And I think continuously having those conversations has definitely taken a toll on my mental state um, and sort of like uh, one thing in particular was when uh, my friends and I decided to go to this protest in New York City. Um, and obviously, like, New York City, NYPD has, like, one of the worst uh, records against Black and Brown um, people. And so we were talking about what happens if we go to this protest and, God forbid, we die. Wow. Wow. And it wasn't something that I ever considered because I've been to protests before. Um, In my mind, worst case scenario is I get arrested, I have to pay a fine, whatever. Uh, The last time that happened, it made for a good law school admissions essay. Um, But now, because things have progressively or continue to get worse, my new worst case scenario is what if I die? What if, what what do I tell my, what do I want people to tell my mom? Um, We were just like going through these things. And I was just like, I don't, I can't do this. Um, I can't keep living my life in this, this fear. Um, I can't keep having to sort of like, think about what happens if I go somewhere at night. Um, I don't want to keep having to wear my Stanford hoodie every time I walk out so that people know that I'm not threatening. Um, there are just so many ways that my life is policed. And if I make one wrong move, that could result in my death. And I'm only 24 years old. Um, and so to have to have these conversations and think about these things as I'm just fighting for my right to exist in this country in which I'm a citizen of, 
um, is just really profound and extremely sad. Um, and so when I asked the chess community to sort of think a little deeper and to be a little more inclusive, I'm not asking for a lot. I'm simply asking you to, to see me as a human being. Um, to remember that, that, that feeling you had when you watched Brooklyn Castle and you like felt all good and bubbly inside. Yes, the poor kids made it. The kid with ADHD won his first tournament. Um, yes, these are all good things and this is what chess can do for you. But at the base or the bare minimum, I'm a human being. I exist. I'm a good person. I do good things. And even if I didn't do good things, that doesn't mean that I'm worthy of death or of, or of dying or of being killed. Um, and I just feel like these are just small ass. And so for the USCS to have taken so long to put out the statement or to recognize that like, this is the daily experience of their black and brown players, um, it's exhausting. I'm tired. Yeah. Wow, that was that was powerful, Rochelle. Well, and I'm sure it's exhausting to talk about, but I'm, I'm glad that you're, you've done so one more time for, for our audience. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. Um, and I think it will, it will open a lot of eye of a lot of eyes. Um, if you're up for it, I just have two, two more questions. Um, one is, so I'm sure there's, I mean, of course it's a chess podcast, so the audience is predominantly white and male. I mean, not exclusively by any means, but, um, but that's the majority of people listening. So beyond the chess world, beyond, uh, you know, calling out any inappropriate behavior and trying to, um, do what you can to foster as welcoming and, uh, diverse an environment as possible. What, what can people do generally like, uh, to, to, on a broader scale in terms of, um, the Black Lives Matter. Do you have a favorite charity that you would suggest donating to, or is there specific um, um, social action you would suggest? Um, whew, so many. So first, <laughs> I'd say uh, follow Greg Shahadi because he's been yeah, on fire lately. He, he has. He has pissed off. <laughs> Big fan. Um, yeah. Likewise. You don't like like if you don't believe what Black people are saying to you, maybe you'd listen to white people because I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Greg Shahadi has definitely been like putting out some great content. Um, but I think at the bare minimum, um, you really just need to read. Uh, and you also need to shut up. You just need to listen to what people are saying and try to imagine from their perspective what they're dealing with. We're not making this up. It's been 400 years in the making. We, <laughs> I just like... I just don't understand what is so difficult to understand. Um, and so I think after you start reading these stories and like hearing and, and seeing the video, like there's actual video that shows what's happening. And so for people to still like say, oh, fake news and like, oh, it's just the left, like sort of making this up, um, you're again missing the point and you are again neglecting the existence of black and brown people. Um, some people obviously are beyond help, but for those who are interested, in learning more, um, there's like ugh, a bunch of things. And obviously and now when I need it the most off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Um, okay. oh, Movement for Black Lives, uh, they put out a lot of great content um, and, and history, uh, which I think is important. Um, talk to your friends, talk to your family members, have these conversations about race um, with each other and and sort of like hammer out what internal biases you have and how that's affected your relationships with people of color um, and ways in which you can be better. But really, it's just it's it's, it's about Googling. And that's the best advice I could give is to just Google, um, Google racism, Google uh, discrimination, Google uh, redlining, Google the achievement gap um, in every space, in every space sector in our lives, race has played an impact and has always played an impact. And to be negligent and to pretend it doesn't exist um, is a death sentence to me. And I don't mean to be dramatic, but I just, I just, I just, like, I, I want to have kids and I want right. my kids to grow up in a world where they don't have to deal with these same things and they don't have to be afraid for their lives. And um, I can't do that by myself. I need everyone 
to sort of come to terms that to come to terms with the fact that we need to change and we need to be better as a race, as a, as a society. Wow. I agree. <laughs> All right. Last one, Rochelle. Um, Jen Shahadi had um, suggested, and I think it's a, a good question. I don't know if you've caught this stuff on social media the last couple of days. I mean, obviously it's not a new question, but um the issue of um, white moving first in chess did, as a kid and now, did you view that as like, a, did you view that as having racist overtones? And do you think that that's something that should be changed in, in the chess world? That is such a silly question. Yeah. Like I mean, it's a grander just, scheme of things. Like it's just, it's childish. Um, no, I never thought that it had racist undertones. Like some boards are are different colors and so it doesn't i don't know it just never that never occurred to me i don't think it needs to be changed i don't think it's that deep and i don't think any of the black players who you talk to care okay yeah um, there was there was an article about it a couple of days ago so like at least on just twitter quote unquote there's been a lot of discussion yeah i think you're focusing or or whoever on chess twitter they're focusing on the wrong things it's not what's happening on the board it's what's happening off the board that's the issue yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I'll just give you the 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 white perspective um, for what it's worth. Um, again, I mean, I agree with you that it's a time pre predominantly for listening and supporting from uh, white people like myself. But when you read something like that, that's why w w I feel like I need to ask someone, someone like you with your experience, you know? Mm, um, I see. Okay, I appreciate your question. Sorry, I didn't mean to trivialize it. No, I that but that was my that honestly that's my opinion as well and uh, and it's not my opinion of um i've agreed with almost everything i mean basically everything you've said i i agree and again i'll never know what it's like and you know w most people listening will never know what it's like to again to to have to fear for your safety uh when you go to a protest to to if you as you mentioned i mean it was really moving when you talk about the idea of having kids and wanting them to wanting to feel like it's safe to bring them into the world so obviously yeah that that is, I mean, infinitely more important. <laughs> um, so, Rochelle, in, unless there's anything you'd like to add, I, I think um, I think you've you've really done an amazing job giving perspective that that I certainly didn't have. So, so thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I would like to shout out Jin Chahadi and her work in bringing more girls into chess. Um, into chess spaces because I don't know if she gets enough credit for it. So I do want to shout her out because it's definitely not something I had when I was growing up playing chess and um, for her to see that need and take the helm in creating um, those spaces is, is important and we should continue to support those initiatives. Yeah. Shout out to Jen and uh, Alexander Botez and everyone pitching in to help raise money. It is, it is great to see. So hopefully uh, chess will become, um, a you know a more diverse environment over time but um it's not going to happen fast enough that's for sure. um but but rochelle um if anyone wants to keep up with you um do you have any preferred social media preference or would you rather just keep your information private what how do you want how do you handle that generally um uh, i mean if, i guess if you search my name on facebook it'll pop up but i generally tend to keep um my life private because I'm not a perfect human. I make mistakes and I do dumb things sometimes. And I'd prefer everyone to keep me in my light of like super smart, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, impressive individual um, and, and just sort of like keep uh, aspects of my life that I that are that are personal to me personal. Um, but yeah, I'm always down to have like conversations um, with people relating to chess. Um, or I, and I tried to do my best to sort of like um, accommodate phone calls and, and meetings and stuff. Um, and yeah, if you want me to like come talk to your school, love wow. kids, so I'd be down to do that um, once COVID ends, of course. Yes, of course. That's the thing. Um, but yeah, I, I really I think I just want to end on sort of just like the the basic sort of, and to not sound, and I, I don't mean to sound elitist because obviously like uh, unequal resources is a thing, but um, 
I think just do your best to sort of just like be knowledgeable in issues that you don't have personal experience in um, and to call out your predatory friends when they are doing gross things at chess tournaments. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. That's, that's what I want to say. Okay. Well, Rochelle, thank you so much. Congratulations on, on your success. And I know you got more coming again, no pressure. Don't get me wrong, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's great to see, uh, it's great to see what you're accomplishing and, um, good luck. Enjoy your summer and good luck in law school. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. Positive reviews on podcast platforms and YouTube help people discover the show, as does telling a friend or sharing it on social media. Speaking of which, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at Beneficial1, or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those who provide financial support to the show, especially right now with so much disruption going on in the world. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page to help sustain and improve Perpetual Chess. And without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharjri, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Driver, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natal, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jen Scream, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster9000, you recently stopped your pledge, but Perpetual Chess will always love you. The famous Mr. Dodgy, Peter Zhodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, and I also would like to thank the following people. Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of US Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Blaskacek, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dirk Decker, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am elect Donnie Ariel, or possible not I am elect, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barter, Giovanni Russo, Greg Harfst, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, Jacob Kovach, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Murr, Jason Woolham, J.D. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Holland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Schnod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Kapala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Beljowski, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salin, Neil Bruce, Negmat Malajanov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal, Charbonneau, Posse Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randall Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hollenbuck, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, Wayne Beam, 
William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. Catch you guys soon.